Greetings, football fans. My name's Darth Cripple, and this is a very special Madden Let's Play. Now, I'm sure you're saying to yourself, there's so many Madden Let's Plays out there. What makes this one any different? Well, let me tell you. I love... I've loved Madden since 2003. I've bought every game since then. But after this last year and some infuriating times with Madden Ultimate Team, I realized that there was something missing that I had loved about Madden. And that was the fact that you could pick all-star rosters for your teams. There used to be like the 91 Eagles and the 95 Cowboys. You could pick, you know, the 84 San Francisco 49ers or the 88 San Francisco 49ers. All-star teams and really good teams in franchise history were all there for, for the picking. And that disappeared over time and now it looks like it's gone for good. So, over the last month, I've been working on this series and this very special 1984 Seahawks roster. If you're interested in the roster, you can find it in the description below. You can locate me on Xbox One and download the roster from there. There are a few problems with the roster as designing 51 unique players all by yourself as opposed to just rewriting the names on some of the rosters, as some folks will be prone to do, I uh, made some mistakes, and one of the big ones was I actually listed their physical birthdays, making all of these players on this 84 Seahawks team over 50 years old, which is very bad if you wanted to take this beyond you know, one franchise season. Another thing is, a few guys will be the wrong ethnicity in this series. I apologize. I was working with very limited information. In order to build the roster, I had to uh, work with Wikipedia, Pro Football Reference, um, some obscure Seahawks articles, and old footage from the 84 season. And uh, so things didn't go quite so great. Uh, once I was about 50 guys in, I was so tired of uh, developing the roster that I sort of just surrendered that there would be a few mistakes. However, I wanted to build this specific team. Why did I choose the 84 Seahawks? Well, first of all, if it isn't clear, I'm a Seahawks fan. And I have been a avid Seahawks fan since the middle of 2002. Um, I've watched every game since then. But I heard a lot of people conversing and talking and debating about whether the 84 defensive team was better than the 2013 Super Bowl champions. And I'm about to contend that the 84 team, despite lacking a Super Bowl championship, is still the better defensive team than the 2013 Seahawks. So, in these, vi in these video series, I plan to play 16 games. If I make the playoffs, that's a bonus. Um, you will see soon enough that I am not very good at the game, so I don't anticipate that I will be making the Super Bowl with this team. But as I play through each game, I tend to, I plan to take a unique angle with each with each game, focusing on a position group. For example, uh, next week's video would feature the wide receiver core and tight ends, talking about each player, their history, how they came to Seattle, their background, on and on. So this week though, if you can see in the title, I wanted to talk about the arrival and career of head coach Chuck Knox in Seattle. 
Chuck Knox came to Seattle, as you see me score this touchdown here. With with a lot of fanfare, he came with a ton of legacy, uh, having having led both the L.A. Rams for five years and the Buffalo Bills for five years and leading them both to playoff prominence before arriving in Seattle in 1983, replacing head coach uh, Jack Patera, who'd been fired during the strike season of 1982, where the, the NFL only played nine games. What Jack put, what Jack Patera lacked that Chuck Knox had was providing a system. He provided an approach of running the ball and playing really good defense. They, Chuck Knox would then use all avenues given to him to rebuild an offensive line and to get a star running back and then remold the defense. One of the big things he did was change the defensive scheme from 4-3 to 3-4. This featured, this allowed Seattle to feature its extremely athletic linebackers and create some different coverages that allowed them to become one of the best pass defenses in the NFL at the time. They also were one of the best special teams units at the time. In fact, ranking number one four out of five years when Chuck Knox first arrived. So Chuck Knox brings the mentality of playing tough defense, playing conservative run offense, which they nicknamed Ground Chuck because it featured a run game and not much in terms of passing ingenuity. Um, there wasn't a lot of routes. There wasn't a lot of complexity to the passing offense. The running offense was where it's at. If you had a 70-play playbook, there was 55 runs in it and 15 passes, maybe. Um, another thing to note was Seattle became one of the best teams at forcing fumbles under Chuck Knox, forcing an average of about 22 per season. Um, I just mean in terms of fumbles they recovered. They actually typically forced about nearly 30 a season, 28 and 84, recovering 25. One of the one of the most interesting things about Chuck Knox's running system is that none of the offensive linemen were bigger than 270 pounds. Most guys were under 260. And at that time, the average offensive lineman was about 275. So it's not like it was a huge difference, but it was certainly these guys operated on a uh, different, you know, plane. They were built to run the ball. They were built to be fast. They were built to, you know, get out in space and beat guys up. And that's what they did. They were not good pass protectors, as Dave Craig would be sacked on average about 40 times per season. Um, another key thing that happened overnight was the tackling for the Seahawks improved. As you'll see the starting defense, I'll go through them for you. Starting nose tackle is Joe Nash. Starting left defensive end is Jeff Bryant. Or I'm sorry, starting left defensive end is actually Jacob Green. Starting right defensive end is Jeff Bryant. Linebackers are Bruce Schultz at uh, left outside linebacker. Um, Inside linebackers are Shelton Robinson and Keith Butler. In the secondary is Dave Brown and Keith Simpson at corner. 
The safeties are John Harris and Kenny Easley. One of the big things Seattle would do on defense in 1984 is create turnovers. They created a total of 63 in 1984 with 25 fumbles recovered and 38 interceptions forced. They also scored eight defensive touchdowns returning one fumble for a touchdown and seven interceptions for touchdowns. They also featured one of the best special teams return units in the NFL, averaging a return of 13 yards per punt and about 31 yards per kick return. Um, that starred not Paul Johns, who was injured about four games into the season, but Kenny Easley, who returned punts eventually, and then Zach Dixon, who returned kicks, with Eric Lane as the other kick returner. Another thing to, to note about Chuck Knox and the Seahawks in 1984 was that despite having their system and having an approach that was completely you know set in stone they lost their running back in the first game of the season Kurt Warner would go out what was it uh, something like on his 10th rushing attempt of the game, but his officially, officially it was his 11th touch with an incredible uh, 11 touches for 59 yards. Another, another key stat after he goes out is that Seattle struggles on offense. They score less than 10 points a game. And in fact, all seven defensive touchdowns from interceptions happen in the span of four weeks. So during the time they can't figure out how to run the ball, and they never really do in terms of finding a guy that can replace Warner, they wind up carrying the offense on defense for those four weeks and they basically retool their offense around Steve Largent at wide receiver and a lot of fans will know automatically who Steve Largent is and Daryl Turner. These guys I will get to their careers and some of their key stats a little bit later as you see me try to return this punt here after free kick sorry free kick after the safety by Jeff Bryant. So, Seattle lost their star runner in the first game of the season. What's interesting about that game, and when I talk about def the defense in 1984 being better than the defense of 2013, Seattle won that game 33 to nothing, and the stat line read like this. Cleveland had... Oh my God, as you see me throw this interception, that's just ridiculous. By the way, if you're curious, I'm recording this commentary in post because I screwed up the audio. Um, so I had to do that. Hopefully in uh, a couple of future videos I can be better and that won't happen. Um, so anyway, they beat Cleveland 33-0 in their, in their home opener in 1984. What's so amazing about that game is that Seattle beats Cleveland into the ground. They have 120 yards of offense. They have 59 passing yards. And like, no, they, yeah, they have 59 passing yards and 63 rushing yards, something like that. It was 
pretty, well, no, it would be 61 passing yards. It would be something like that. Any, whatever adds up to 120 there. But, I mean, they, they gagged some offenses that year. And so in their home opener, destroying Cleveland but losing Kurt Warner kind of left them floundering. But Chuck Knox's defense, which, interestingly enough, though he changed the scheme from a 4-3 to a 3-4, a lot of the same guys were there. A lot of guys were there before Chuck Knox arrived. Guys like Joe Nash, Jacob Green were there. Um, guys like uh, Keith Butler and John Harris were there. Uh, Dave Brown was also there. So Chuck Knox took a lot of the existing roster and really molded them into a better defense. Um, a couple of other things of note, particularly in that season, was the fact that while they retooled the offense, um, they also retooled the offensive line a couple of times. Um, they did, in fact, after the 1983 season in which they made the AFC Championship, they went out and tried to replace their starting right tackle, Steve August, with, a, with another veteran guy in Bob Kreider. Um, because Steve August had really been bad in that AFC Championship game, but he'd been bad for for a few for a few seasons before that. In fact, in the AFC Championship game against the Oakland Raiders in '83, he got Dave Craig murdered on at least a couple of snaps, in which I thought Howie Long had literally ripped Dave Craig in half, which. I'm not sure it's physically possible, but if it was, it would definitely be something Howie Long could do at the time. Um, another, uh, another thing worth noting in terms of uh, Chuck Knox, as you see me throw another ridiculous interception here, is that he brought a lot of his own coaches along with him that a lot of these guys stuck with him uh, through the entirety of his career as a head coach. Wherever he went, they followed. And one key guy here is Tom Catlin, who coached the defense. And uh, they had some offensive coordinators that shifted out, but, but the 84 team uh, featured Ray Pachaska as uh, offensive coordinator. The other interesting fact uh, about the team was that they weren't very good offensively. Despite scoring 31 passing touchdowns, Dave Craig also had 24 interceptions that season. Um, this led to a lot of bad field position for that defense, and I think can add to my case of them having to deal with maybe offenses that uh, maybe situations that the 2013 Seahawks didn't have to deal with. And despite all that, uh, with a turnover-prone quarterback who had 13 fumbles and 24 interceptions in 1984, uh, only gave up something like, I think it was 260-some-odd. Let me check real quick. Let me check. It was 282 points, so about 51 more points overall than the 2013 team. But that was with a quarterback that had really a lot of turnover problems. Um, a couple of key notes in this game, in the home opener for Seattle was that Dave Craig actually had a pretty good pretty good line. Three touchdowns on just 14 completions, one interception, but he did just have a 50% completion percentage. Um, 
Paul Johns had three catches for 49 yards. Pete Metzlars actually had three catches for 46 yards. I'll get to him later on. A couple of inter other interesting notes is Steve Largent only had two catches for 17 yards, and Daryl Turner had one catch for 34 yards and a touchdown. couple of notes defensively was that Bruce Davis for Cleveland had oh never mind never mind that's n that's nothing that's nothing um, Zach Dixon would return a kick for a touchdown actually and Kenny Easley would have two punt returns for 59 yards Paul Johns would have three punt returns for 26 yards. Hmm. Well, that's not how this was supposed to shake out. But Norm Johnson completed uh, four field goal, field goal attempts and three extra points. Another interesting fact is that In this game, the only guy worthwhile let's let's take a look. All right, so it's third down and four. 6.45 to go in the second quarter. They get pressure, and Ted Ginn drops it. And anybody that's watched Ted Ginn's career knows that's very common. The kick is up. The kick is good. And Seattle's down by 8 with 6.37 to go. Paul John's back to take the kick. You'll see me change the play a lot. Uh, probably shouldn't do it nearly as much as I do, but... I'm not one that picks through the playbook a lot, so I'm going to use audibles more as my playbook, which probably isn't as helpful, but I just, I lose too much time. I always get, you know, delay a game and stuff because I'm always picking plays too late, especially on offense. So here I'm going to try to get the ball out, but there's nobody open, and I take a sack from Luda Lele. This has just not been a good game. Not a good game at all. And Jeff West gets a nice punt off to Ted Ginn, who doesn't make much of a move and gets stopped. Now Jeff West is a bit of an interesting story. I told you Seattle's offense in 1984 wasn't very good, despite being able to score a lot um, in terms of the passing game and some other things. The big problem for them was that because they had to pass more because their running game was terrible, um, they had no running back that had better than 3.3 yards per carry. And... So that left a lot of downs that needed to be picked up by throwing. And so there were a lot of three and outs that involved the throwing game. And so by the end of the season, Jeff West had punted 95 times for 37 yards per punt. Which actually fundamentally isn't very good, but when you think of the volume of punts he had to make, I'm pretty sure that some of that had to do with just having to do it so much. Um, 
so there's another tackle and it just it goes on and on like this it's really stalemated and I, I'm not doing very good at route selection here I could have thrown to I could have thrown to Paul Johns there he probably had some space some separation I could have I may have been able to throw him loose and now I'm about to make another mistake here by throwing to Steve Largent, in which I'm intercepted for a third time. I think it's three, maybe four. Um, I was not having a very good game here. Uh, calling some pressures with uh, Shelton Robinson from the inside. He gets an excellent rush, but can't make the tackle on Jonathan Stewart, who picks a great running running lane to go through and everything's just going south in this game for me I'm not even getting much pressure from my defensive line which is a little depressing I may have to change some of that because Jacob Green is a better pass rusher than what's being shown here And that's Joe Nash getting in there with the pressure. That's nice. So you have uh, Greg Gaines at linebacker, Bruce Schultz, Keith Butler, and Shelton Robinson. And those guys have a lot of speed, but they didn't have... A lot of awareness for play action at times so I think if there had been more play action in this game I may have lost here you see an interception to Keith Simpson which is just you know he's throwing to Ted Ginn which I don't get because Ted Ginn just drops the ball anyway why would you throw it to him so now I think I'm gonna try to throw that streak to Paul Scanzi and I get it which is exciting, and I'll talk more about Paul Scancy next week. He actually should have a bigger place in Hawks lore in terms of their history uh, than he does. He didn't have, like, a huge, brilliant career, but he has one of the best historical stories for the Seahawks franchise I think there is out there, if you could talk about one guy making a, a historic play. They talk about Richard Sherman and the tip this last year, but there's a there's a play I'll talk about next week with Paul Scanzi that I think is just as just as good and ju should be just as remembered. I probably could have thrown to Daryl Turner there, corner over the top of the route. Turner had good isolation. I just missed it. As I said, I'm not very good at the game, so. And that does nothing for them. And here we go. Close of the second half. Joe Nash with some more pressure again. He sure is getting free a lot. Wish my defensive ends would do the same thing. Kind of need more pressure from Jacob Green and Jeff Bryant. Another great pass to, to Greg Olson. Sorry, I kind of had to swallow and sort of forgot his name, too. And he steps back and makes a throw, and... Ugh. And here's something that's interesting. Watch the clock here. Right at six seconds, they're going to get the playoff. Had it been a second later, they probably don't call the snap. But since they do, they run the screen. It runs the time off the clock, and I don't give up a field goal. This would actually, I think, come back to haunt them in a huge way later on. That's caught by Dominic Hickson. Now... If you see the model of Chuck Knox there, that's a little depressing for me. I, I did find a sweater vest, but 
Even that doesn't have the Seahawks logo on it. And if you look up any pictures of Chuck Knox and uh, Chuck Knox and the Seahawks, as Bruce Schultz gets a nice sack there on the on the right side, just going through a guy. Um, if you look up Chuck Knox, um, old pictures of him with the Seahawks, he had this fishnet trucker's hat, like totally an 80s hat. It's it's pretty iconic. Whenever I've seen Chuck Knox without it, it's very confusing as a Seahawks fan. Um, Shelton Robinson being set out for the outside rush here. And they call a good play, but they don't get the first down. Cam Newton's got a good completion percentage. But as you can see, yards per play aren't, pretty, aren't very stunning. But don't worry, I think I'm going to help him out at least one more time. Paul John's back to receive the kick. Kenny Easley lays a nice block there. I can't get around it, though. And I'm probably going to try to go for the go route here with Steve Largent. Probably not going to get it. Yep, yep, Steve's going to get obliterated. I've been doing that to him all game, too, if you've noticed. I had a real, I had a real hard time getting a handle on, on the passing techniques because you're supposed to, like, flick the stick. I mean, I grew up on Tecmo Super Bowl, so I'm not very good at this. Um, and I think the last Madden game I was really dedicated to playing routinely was Madden 08. For the X, for the original Xbox, so there's a lot of these new tools I'm probably not utilizing properly. If any of you are watching this and have some advice, I would really appreciate it. Also, I want to go through the starting offense real quick. I probably should have done that at the beginning of the video, but um, starting offense is Dave Craig at quarterback. Charlie Young at tight end, Steve Largent, Daryl Turner at wide receiver, and starting offensive line is Ron Essink, left tackle, left guard, Reggie McKenzie, center, Blair Bush, right guard, Robert Pratt, and right tackle, Bob Kreider. Now, Bob Kreider is also a white guy. He's not black. I apologize if Bob Kreider sees this. It was not intentional. I apologize, sir. So here we go again. We're on third and 11, and I'm probably either going to have to punt here or I think, nope, nope, I'm going to throw an interception. Yeah. Uh, or no, 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 I forgot. This probably isn't where I do that. I've, I've got at least one more in me, I know that. Jeff West with another great kick. Yeah, that's two kicks on the one. I hope we get an achievement for that. I turned off the notifications. So I still don't know if there is one for that. Probably isn't. Mm. But let's see what the defense does here. I really think the 3-4 offense, by the way, is the most versatile and the most interesting of defenses. It's a little more complicated, and it makes the quarterback a little more nervous about throwing the ball. But if, if, he, can, if he can get a great read on what a 3-4 is doing, he also can shred it because you're, you're putting one less pass rusher up at the line of scrimmage. Usually. Uh, I'm utilizing uh, Mike Tomlin's playbook for the Seahawks defense because... I think that their, that their version of the 3-4 was the most similar. It may not match entirely, but I, I tried doing that. Um, I may try to get a look at uh, some tendency stuff if I can in terms of blitzes. I'm sure they've talked about it. I have some 84 games, and I'll try to get a look at it, maybe design a playbook that I can then upload for, for guys that maybe want to be a little more authentic with the 84 football team. Hmm. 
And here we go on second and two. Greg Olson goes in motion, almost runs into the left guard. Don't know what that was all about. Keith Butler on the stop. I really got to say that Jonathan Stewart is one of those guys that probably should be faster in, in terms of Madden. I don't think he's represented as fast enough for what he actually is. I mean, he played for Oregon, for God's sake. The guy was fast. Yeah. Even that guy seems faster than Jonathan Stewart. Maybe I'm just seeing things. So, things are going pretty much south. They are draining the third quarter on me. And... Dave Brown makes an impressive stop on Cam Newton there. Dave Brown, who's an uh, impressive Seahawks career, began right when the team started. He was one of the players Seattle picked up from the Pittsburgh Steelers in part of the, I think he was an unprotected player. Drafted in the first round by Pittsburgh in 1975, Seattle picked him up in 76 after uh, Dave Brown didn't play very much, and Greg Golson goes out of bounds for an, some inexplicable reason. By the way, this is set on all Madden mode. As I'm not very good at the game, I think it's representative of my skill level. But if anyone has some slider advice, I, I would take that too. And this is a weird play. I've never had that happen on a kickoff before. Is anybody else? Because I don't think... Because I, I saw at least two times where players couldn't locate the ball in the air on a kickoff like that. Where they kind of ran forward. Because I, I wasn't controlling him at the time. Ah, yes, yes. Here comes my other interception. Oh, I guess not. I guess not. I know I throw one more. I know I do somewhere. Um, so, to finish some conversation about Chuck Knox. So, Chuck Knox arrives in 83, takes the team all the way to the AFC Championship game. They had beaten... There it is. There's the other interception I was looking for. God, I was playing so badly. Um, so Chuck Knox comes in in 83, takes the team to the AFC Championship game with an improbable victory over uh, the Miami Dolphins at home um, in Dolphin Stadium on basically the last plays of the game. Uh, Dave Craig had played utterly terrible for most of the game. Seattle had the lead. Then Dave Craig threw a pick six that gave Miami the lead late. And then Dave Craig leads the game-winning drive to beat Miami in Miami and leads them to the AFC Championship game in which the Raiders basically take their offensive line and beat it with sticks even though it's like wet tissue paper it was it was pretty bad it was it was abysmal to be honest and steve august was the worst of them all i think he gave up not just two sacks two were the two were pretty bad where he folded craig in half but i'm sure he gave up four in that game because he was subsequently traded the next season um but he would return later in the season after Pittsburgh cut him because he was traded to Pittsburgh. Not sure what they got for him. But um, so Chuck Knox comes in in 84. Team goes 12-4. and four, Probably is one of the better defenses in NFL history. Um, you know, and just offensively isn't strong enough and isn't consistent enough to, to go all the way or beat the Dolphins again. In Miami. So. 
Chuck Knox would then have winning seasons pretty consistently up until the 1989 season. And then the 1990 season. And then I think... No, no, he had a winning season in 90. He just didn't make the playoffs. I believe I believe that's the case. Yes. Yes, he had a winning season in 1990. Then he retired in, or he resigned in 1991. The team replaced him with former Raiders head coach and then current GM and president of the organization in Seattle, uh, Tom Flores, which wound up being an utter disaster for them. And then Seattle really went into the dark ages of its franchise after that happened. But Chuck Knox was the first coach ever really to build this franchise into a perennial playoff contender. In, at that time, what was the, the worst uh, uh, division in terms of finding a, you know, a team that would consistently come out of there. You had the Broncos with young Elway. You had the Chargers with Dan Fouts, which was a high-powered offense. You had um, the Raiders, which were a perennial Super Bowl contender for for most of the early to mid-'80s. I mean, it was really a tough division. If you want to talk about the NFC West now, the AFC West in the 80s was the best division in football in terms of competitiveness. And now I absolutely airmailed that, which is probably good because I probably would have been picked off again. Now, oh my God, I had Charlie Young wide open and Scanzi was open late. Now Scanzi, Paul Scanzi is also white. I somehow made him into a into a oh no as we see here Daryl Turner takes an injury and that's all Seattle needed cuz when i designed the roster Daryl Turner is really the only guy they have with with a lot of size and speed um the other guy that they have size with Daryl Turner I'm sorry Daryl Turner was 63 but he had a receiving average in 1984 of almost of 20 of better than 20 yards. I think it was 20.7 or 21.7 somewhere around there. And so him going down is absolutely horrible because no other receiver has that deep threat potential. And uh, the only other guy with size on the team, if uh, Daryl Turner's down for any significant period of time is actually Byron Walker, who was uh, 6'4". But there I go getting that that uh, nice uh, curl route. It's not a curl route. What is it? An out pattern to Steve Largent. This is... This is utterly a bad game. And then I get blitzed and Greg Hardy gets a sack and then beats his wife. I... That's not it. But now I see it's man coverage. The leverage is gained by Largent. Toss it over. And there's a touchdown. I do like that he played a little air guitar there, Steve. Though he was... Not much in the, in terms of celebration. He might throw his arms up if he was a little excited. But mostly he was going to hand the ball to the referee and move on. You're just pretty pretty classy a guy, but the little electric guitar makes me think of the 80s anyway. And the kick is good, and the comeback's on, I hope. Uh, Norm Johnson... There's a guy I'll talk about in a little bit when I confront special teams here in a few videos. I actually got to meet him at uh, Children's Hospital when I was a little bit younger. 
That guy is huge for a kicker. He was like 6'3". And there's the triple option. And Mike Tolbert pays the price. Now let's see, let's see here. I do hate how the the computer decides to slow down the game right right when they have a timeout called for an injury or something like that. It's very strange. Calling an all out blitz here. Hopefully it gets home. It did cause it did cause Cam Newton to panic, which gives Terry Jackson a chance to tackle him. Now, one thing you will note about this roster is that everybody is a quality tackler. And we have a what the hell was that kind of pass. And is that Brian Mormon? I don't think so. Paul John's back to receive the kick. And John Harris attempts to block in the back and face plants on the field. So that happened. As you can see, Byron Walker's in. I'm probably going to go ahead and change him out because Paul Scanzi being number two doesn't actually make sense. Because as you see when they switch sides of the field, Scanzi doesn't actually have a ton of speed even though he just showed that um, in the game he doesn't really have a lot of speed he's a possession receiver with quality routes so I really want him to be in the middle of the field where he can impact the game a little more now I'm gonna run some streak routes I'm gonna miss Paul Johns by a mile but anybody that watched Dave Craig in real time is used to him missing wide open receivers throwing tons of interceptions the only bummer is I don't think I actually fumble in this game and I say that because Dave Craig actually retired with the most fumbles for a quarterback I think was something like 155 although I will say this if you look up a highlight there, there's a highlight somewhere as I almost throw my sixth interception in the game. There's a highlight somewhere of Dave Craig getting the ball slapped out of his hand. He chases the ball, fields, catches it on a rebound as it's bouncing up off the field, catches it, throws it up, and scores a 22-yard touchdown. I don't think there's any quarterback in the league today that could do that. Maybe, maybe Cam Newton actually could, but I but I doubt that there's a guy that would that would be that lucky because I don't think Dave Craig intended to actually throw the touchdown. I think he was trying to throw it away because he was under total panic. And there is the Carolina D line that's given me so much trouble throughout this game in terms of runs. I've basically been using draws against them mostly because I couldn't get them to drive off the ball. But then we get a nice double team from Charlie Young and Pete Metzelars there, and that gets Kurt Warner into the end zone. And the comeback is complete as the game will now be tied. And here's Ted Ginn. You know, I always wonder about why he sucks at catching the ball, but he's so good on, like, kick returns and punt returns. Because I think he does punt returns, right? Or, no, that might not be him. I'm not sure. But the fact that he can do that, and Kenny Easley almost has the interception as the pressure brought smacks Cam Newton in the back.
You know, I really just just as an aside, as a football fan, I think the introduction of the pistol has created a whole bunch of potential for modern NFL offenses, particularly in the rushing game. I know Ron Jaworski says you have to be a pocket quarterback and blah 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 and and the and the, the the read option won't work, but I don't think you need the read option for as a reason to run the pistol. And I think the pistol provides just a unique offensive dynamic. I I like it as a football fan. And there's John Harris with the interception. And Madden chooses to give me the indication that it's been intercepted a little late there. Because um, I wasn't sure he actually caught it. So, now I'm going to probably take the conservative route. And by conservative, I mean almost probably throw it where I shouldn't throw it again. As I chose to throw it to Steve on a one-on-one -on -one situation, which wasn't truly one on Well, it was. The safety was late getting over the top. I threw it in behind the corner so that I had that going for me, which is nice. And Steve Largent with a 20-yard per reception average. Though all the times I attempted to throw him the ball and got him murdered, he's probably like, I hate you. I hate you so much. And, and you know what? I'm not even going to be mad at him. I'm not even going to be mad. Jeff Bryant goes in motion. Nice run there. And the fact that we're 50% on third downs is just utterly mind-boggling for how bad I was playing. And Dan Dornick's now in at running back on third down as we drain away the clock a little bit. The Panthers, who basically obliterated every run I've had to the outside through most of the game. Two, one. Hands to Dan Dornick. Charlie Young with the outside block just absolutely crushes a guy. And I get the edge and the first down. And this looks like it's going to be game over because it's going to be a chip shot field goal. So I will take you forward in time a little bit to finish the game. And that's how it ends. 26-23, Seattle opens the season. Dave Craig not so hot with five interceptions, but Kurt Warner has over 100 yards on offense. Steve Largent has over 100 yards. Seattle walks away with its first victory, and hopefully I can improve this series and this team and my performance in Madden before the next video. If you like this, please like and subscribe, or just take a look and uh, download the rosters if you're interested. I'll see you next time.